I'm speaking to you from this side chapel of Shrewsbury Cathedral, where you can see a picture, a reredos behind me, which is the backdrop to my words to you today. The artist desired to share a message, beginning from the gospel words, which are inscribed from St. Matthew's Gospel above it. Learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. The central figure you see is Christ, showing us his heart burning with divine love. And the side panels depict something quite surprising. The hearts of the saints in every time and place of caught fire with the same divine love. This has enabled them to rise to the challenge of their times, even when all have might have been seemed lost. We catch sight there of Saint Benedict, who was set on fire as the civilization he knew collapsed into the dark ages. We catch sight of Saint Teresa and Saint Ignatius, both afire at a moment when the church was damaged by scandals and riven by dissension. And Saint Margaret Mary, burning with Eucharistic love at a moment when the heresy of the Jansenists had chilled so many hearts. Each learnt from the same heart of Jesus. Yet this learning is not mere human imitation. It is what the Holy Spirit makes possible. The love of God, St. Paul declares, has been poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Romans 5, 5. St. Augustine later commented that this love diffused in our hearts by the Holy Spirit is the love by which God enables us to love him perfectly. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit enables each of us, baptized and confirmed, to catch fire with divine love in every generation. This is what the picture behind me declares, so that everyone may carry out our mission in the time which is uniquely entrusted to us. In the all-powerful love of the Holy Spirit, promised to the Church and every member of her, how could a challenge of any scale or at any time, however dark, be daunting to us? We are the first generation for more than a century to have lived through a pandemic. Today I want to draw some lessons from the experience of this time, which in God's plan was to be ours. Many of us thought lockdown announced in March of last year would last only for a few weeks. Nothing like this lockdown had ever been seen before in peacetime. We were legally restricted from travelling, even from leaving our homes and making personal contact with loved ones. Yet the way in which the whole of society rose to this daunting challenge with a Christian motivation to protect the most vulnerable was impressive in itself. Pope Francis memorably reflected before a windswept and deserted St. Peter's Square, how we saw in the crisis the example of those who had responded by giving their lives in imitation of the heart which had loved humanity so much. The Holy Father declared, this is the force of the Spirit poured out in courageous and generous self denial. It is the life in the Spirit that can redeem, value and demonstrate how our lives are 
woven together and sustained by ordinary people, often forgotten people, said Pope Francis, who do not appear in newspapers or magazines nor on the catwalks of the latest show, but who are without doubt in these very days writing the decisive history of our times. Pope Francis went on to name in particular doctors and nurses, supermarket employees, cleaners, caregivers, providers of transport, law and order forces, volunteers, priests, religious men and women, and so very many others. We recognise in the vision which first inspired the New Dawn Conference how a hidden spiritual struggle underlies the whole of human history. St Paul reminds us powerfully in the letter to the Ephesians that it is not against human enemies that we have to struggle, but against the sovereignties and the powers which originate in the darkness of the world. Ephesians 6, 12. It should not entirely surprise us then that a dark shadow should be so quickly cast over our whole endeavour as a society to cherish life and protect the most vulnerable. Even before the public health crisis was over, legislation was being introduced into both the Westminster and Scottish parliaments to remove legal protections from some of the most vulnerable members of society. The effect would be to make those who had been caregivers during the pandemic into life takers. The commandment, thou shall not kill, has stood as the foundation of our laws, protecting those vulnerable in sickness and frailty. This foundation would be decisively breached by what is now being proposed. The first intent is to permit the practice of medically assisted suicide, which paves the way towards the goal of the widespread practice of euthanasia. Euthanasia, directed against the very people society has sacrificed so much in these months to protect. The irony could not escape us that for such a purpose, the Christian language of compassion and the dignity of the human person are being deployed to disguise the intent to kill, either requiring the medical profession to assist someone in killing themselves or eventually to directly kill the sick and the aged. From the experience of nations where this shadow has already fallen, the culture of death quickly sees legal protections removed from the most vulnerable groups, from the mentally ill, even to children. St. John Paul II, in his great 1995 letter to the Church Evangelium Vitae, foresaw these fearful developments at the dawn of the third Christian millennium. He saw them in clear, apocalyptic terms. They constitute, he said, a global struggle between the proclamation and living out of the gospel of life and the remorseless advance of a culture of death. At this moment in history that has been entrusted to us, may we be ready to raise our prayers and our voices for the sanctity of human life. May each of us, as we go from this conference, at the very least, contact our members of Parliament to express our concern at these developments and our determination 
to uphold the Judeo-Christian foundations on which our society and caring professions have been built and the most vulnerable protected. Yet our voices raised might become shrill, as St. Paul indicates in a memorable passage of his first letter to the Corinthians, the hymn to charity. The apostle there reflects, if I have all the eloquence of men or of angels, but speak without love, I am simply a gong booming or a cymbal clashing. 1 Corinthians 13, 1. And so I want to focus upon another great lesson to be drawn from the experience of the pandemic, that our hearts will remain alight by our participation in the Most Holy Eucharist. During the first months of lockdown restrictions, which saw church doors closed, we witnessed an extraordinary effort to literally stay connected to the Mass and the adoration of the Holy Eucharist. The cathedral, this cathedral, witnessed the largest attendances in its history, albeit remotely, with tens of thousands connected for a celebration of Mass or for an hour of the adoration of the Blessed Sacrament of the Eucharist. I encourage people in the diocese on their once daily walk, remember that, to consciously turn to our Lord as they passed their local church. The faithful were even seen resting their heads in prayer against the walls of churches and the railings of our sadly locked churches. Recognising here the source of grace, our whole strength, the miracle of love, which is the Eucharist. The government itself would come to recognise through the voices of so many contacting their members of Parliament that gathering for public worship is essential to society. We came to rediscover, we might say, through this pandemic, what might have been too easily taken for granted. That worship is not only the fundamental human freedom, it is our human vocation. It is what we were made for. The Catholic Church teaches that this worship is supremely offered in the sacrifice of the Mass, in which God is supremely glorified and humanity sanctified. This was the beautiful teaching of the Second Vatican Council. We all saw how so many returned with joy to participate again personally, actively in the Holy Eucharist and the most extraordinary lengths we went to to ensure our open churches were among the safest places in society. This is now the time to build upon this witness the joyful rediscovery of the pandemic months which also brought many to glimpse the Church's worship and the mystery and reality of the Eucharist, even remotely, via the internet. With all of the saints depicted in the beauty of the Rebidos behind me, may our own hearts so burn with the fire of love found in the Holy Eucharist. In the words of the prayer with which Pope St. John Paul II ended his 1995 letter, The Gospel of Life, may we take new heart, new wits, new confidence 
in the witness that we are called to give. These are the words of St. John Paul II. The lamb who was slain is alive, bearing the marks of his passion in the splendor of the resurrection. He alone is master of all the events of history. He opens its seals and proclaims in time and beyond the power of life over death. In the new Jerusalem, that new world towards which human history is traveling, death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. Revelation 21, 4. And as we, the pilgrim people, the people of life and for life, make our way in confidence towards a new heaven and a new earth, we look to her who is for us a sign of sure hope and solace. O Mary, bright dawn of the new world, mother of the living, to you do we entrust the cause of life. Look down, O mother, upon the vast numbers of babies not allowed to be born, of the poor whose lives are made difficult, of men and women who are victims of brutal violence, of the elderly and the sick killed by indifference or out of a misguided mercy. Grant that all who believe in your Son may proclaim the gospel of life with honesty and love to the people of our time. Obtain for them the grace to accept that gospel as a gift ever new, the joy of celebrating it with gratitude throughout their lives and the courage to bear witness to it resolutely in order to build together with all people of goodwill the civilization of truth and love to the praise and glory of God, the creator and the giver of life. And may the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with you this day and remain with you always. Amen. Amen.